Hello everyone and welcome, it's Federico once again. I'm sure you all missed me uh, today. <laughs> we'll be discussing this uh, this nice paper by uh, Henry Gook, Eib Frank, Bernard Faringer and Michael J. Creep um, from University of Edinburgh and University of Waikato. Um, so this paper is titled Regularization of Neural Networks by Enforcing Lipschitz Continuity. And uh, yeah, so this is quite a nice paper which builds up on some uh, of one of specifically one of the old videos uh, which is on Lipschitz continuity of neural networks uh, I recommend you go watch it. I can't remember exactly what I titled it but it's something about Lipschitz regularization uh, anyway this builds on this so the abstract we investigate the effect of explicitly enforcing the Lipschitz continuity as you would expect from the title uh, we provide a simple technique for computing an upper bound uh, for multiple p norms um, of a feedforward neural network composed of commonly used layers, which uh, is quite nice. Um, and then our technique is then used to formulate training a neural network with a bounded Lipschitz constant as a constraint optimization problem that can be solved using projected stochastic gradient descent methods. Um, our evaluation study shows that the performance exceeds that of model trained with other common regularizers. Um, okay. Sounds good. Let's get into now. This is quite a long paper, so I just won't cover all of it, but I'll cover the most uh, important parts. Um, so the again, uh, if you have two metric spaces with X with the uh, oops, this is, I guess, just kind of a, ref a quick refresher. If you have two metric spaces, one X with metric uh, DX and one Y with metric DY. Now, what you can do is uh, is you can um, you can get this k here, which is called the Lipschitz constant. And this is pretty much a bound. So you can imagine it again as a bound of, uh, of the gradient almost of the function, right? So something like this, if you, whoops, this is an f, um, is being bounded uh, by k, right? So this is the idea, pretty much uh, we're bounding dy dx, right? And, and the, the, the intuition is that we want this k to be rather small. Because if k is not large, then if we take some uh, x plus delta, uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, if we take some x plus delta, uh, then what this means, if this k is not large, that this has the potential to uh, the function. So let's say this is like x, and then this is x plus delta for a small delta. Then this this little delta means that let's say this is x delta, and then let's say this is uh, f of x. Um, it means that this delta can actually cause like a big perturbation, right? If this is this is f of x plus delta, uh, x plus delta. So that's the idea. Um, pretty much. Also, what we can also um, do is is uh, is we take a neural network composed of of many layers. So let's say this is the input layer, and then this is all the hidden layers and the activation layers and so on and then this is the output what we can do is say okay well this is the first uh phi one the first uh, kind of linear layer and then we compose it uh with phi two which is like the activation layer then phi three and so on and so forth until we reach the end and this is exactly what we're doing so maybe this is the the first uh hidden layer then here uh, we would get like the activation layer and then so on and so forth. And then obviously this is quite a general form. You can do it for more complex layers and stuff. And, and the idea is that if uh, phi one uh, has a Lipschitz constant of K one and uh, phi two has a Lipschitz or phi L, I guess has Lipschitz constant of K L. What you can do is then say, uh, okay, then if we bound, if we get this Lipschitz constant L, uh, of, of, of the entire network, it's this, it's bounded above by the product of all these networks. And, and this comes again, just by reading it uh, here. Um, so such networks can be expressed as a series of function compositions, as we, as we were discussing, uh, where each phi is an activation function, linear operation, or pooling operation. Um, so then this property of, of Lipschitz uh, composition, which is quite trivial to, to see, is that uh, if a function is k1 Lipschitz continuous, uh, function f1, and then the other one is uh, k2 Lipschitz continuous, uh, the composition is uh, is k1, k2 Lipschitz continuous. And this is just literally straight from the definition. Uh, the proof is very straightforward. Um, and then you get this bound. Cool. 
um, so we can compute the Lipschitz constant for each layer in isolation and combine them. And then this is what we were discussing before, right? Um, yeah. So let's look now at, uh, at some more uh, in-depth uh, analysis of, of, uh, of layers. Now I'll just go over, I think, the fully connected layer and then you can actually read the paper. I just want to kind of give the idea of the paper in this uh, video. So let's say we have this uh, um, F fully connected layer, uh, phi FC, uh, which implements an affine transformation. Now, again, a lot of people get this wrong, so maybe it's uh, useful uh, to go over it. If you have Y, whoops, if you have Y equals MX, this is called a, a linear transformation. And then plus C, this is the, affi the, the affinity. So, so namely, um, linear um, op linear transformations are a special case of affine transformations. So, so by affine transformations, they just mean a linear one with with some kind of uh, shift, right? The, the B is just shifting the result uh, by a constant, or I mean, not a constant, well, yeah, depends how you look at it, but yeah. Um, so what we can do is we can, this is just a classic uh, linear layer, uh, well, <laughs> uh, linear layer idea, and then, um, so others have established that under the L2 norm, the Lipschitz constant of a fully connected layer is given by the spectral norm of the weight matrix. Um, so we provide a slightly more general formulation. Um, and this is actually very, very nice. So what they're doing here is uh, just literally plugging in uh, the definition of the fully connected layer inside the, the, uh, this formula here, uh, right here. Um, and, and you get this. And then by setting uh, a to be x1 minus x2, we can get this uh, arrangement and just by um, dividing by a, assuming that it's non-zero, we get this. Uh, and then what we, what we can also notice is that this is, uh, is very similar to the formalization or to the formulation of, of a matrix norm. So what we can do is uh, if we take the supremum, we can notice that the smallest Lipschitz constant is equal to the supremum of the left-hand side of the inequality. Um, so, uh, so what we're pretty much finding what the Lipschitz constant is for this layer, right? Um, so if we take the supremum, then we, we can find the smallest K, which is exactly what we wanted to do because um, pretty much the argument is quite straightforward. If we have this K here, then we have uh, that, and then we have this uh, formulation here. Uh, I'm really bad at writing, but you get the idea. So we have this equation here. What we're saying is if we maximize this, because th since this is always below K, uh, if we aim to find this, well, not like I guess we find the supremum of this, uh, then we get K, right? Um, because, uh, yeah, obviously. So. Um, for the p norms, uh, we consider there exist efficient algorithms for computing operator norms on relatively large matrices. So for p1, the operator norm is the maximum absolute column sum norm. For p max, the operator norm is the maximum absolute row sum norm. And then uh, for p2, which again I think we've went over, it, is the is the spectral norm. So the spectral norm again the largest singular value of the weight matrix. So you look at the positive eigenvalues which are non-zero, take uh, the square root of them, and then the largest one is the spectral norm. Um, so, and then we we can approximate this quite quickly with a small number of, of iterations of power methods. So again, this is quite a, a straightforward argument, but then it says, like, okay, we can calculate for any any P norm quite trivially the, um, the Lipschitz constant of a linear layer. Uh, and then here they do it for uh, convolutional layers, they do it for pooling layers and activation functions. Again, I think activation functions, we were discussing how most common activation functions and pooling operators are worse one, one Lipschitz. Um, and yeah. So here, I think algorithm one, uh, okay, well, this is just a power method. This is not so interesting, maybe. They do it for residual connections. And then here, this paragraph is actually what's, uh, what's interesting. Um, so the assumption mot motivating your work is adjusting the Lipschitz constant of a feed for all network uh, controls how well the model will generate new data. Um, again, this is the idea that uh, we want to try to lower the weight matrices to um, to not make them blow up because we, we want uh, 
again this uh, a small perturbation to not have a big effect on 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 the output right um this is again for uh the f adversarial defense like a defense against adversarial attacks but also for um just simply generalization issues um thus controlling the lipschitz constant of a network can be a comp okay uh we have shown that lipschitz constant is a product okay and we and so here they're just saying that we can uh, we can do it for each layer, and since we know how to do it for each layer, this is this becomes possible. Um, so um, in practice, we pick a simple hyperparameter and use it to control the upper bound of the Lipschitz constant for its layer. This means that the network as a whole will have a Lipschitz constant less than, less than or equal to lambda to the d, where d is the depth of the network. And then this is uh, shown here. Um, so this is their projected. Uh, stochastic gradient descent to optimize a neural network subject to the Lipschitz constant constraint. Um, so pretty much what they're doing is um, is projecting on you have this weight matrix um, and you're pretty much just projecting it by this. So this becomes a new weight matrix and um, and you do it until this uh, uh, let's just re let's just keep reading I guess they, I'm sure they can explain it better. Um, so the easiest way to adapt to existing deep learning methods to allow for constraint optimization is to introduce a projection step and perform a variant of the project pro projected stochastic gradient descent method. Um, so in particular, because each parameter matrix is constrained in isolation, it is straightforward to project any infeasible parameter values back into a set of feasible matrix spaces or matrices. Um, so after each weight update step, we must check that none of the weight matrices are violating the constraint of the Lipschitz constant. And if they are, uh, we must replace the resulting matrix with the closest matrix that does lie in the feasible set. Uh, and then this is done through this projection function uh, pi. So pretty much what they're saying is, uh, okay, uh, we, have, um, we have a bunch of weight matrices and w which control like for them. So pretty much the Lipschitz constant is a function of these weight matrices. And then what we do is it's just a projection, right? So if we have like a, oops, if we have like a plane uh, of of weight matrices, right, which are f which are within the Lipschitz uh, kind of constraint, and then we have uh, so let's say like a a vector on the plane is fine. Instead, what we um, if we have this vector here, what we do is we simply project it uh, to this vector here, which is on the plane. So obviously there is some loss in this process, but they're arguing that this loss is. Uh, is sensible pretty much uh, and then here there's the details of the algorithm um, so you're just uh, yeah you're just doing projected gradient descent but the, the projection is this in case so what they're saying is that if you do this um, you um, you will end up with a Lipschitz constant which is bounded by lambda d so obviously lambda is a hyperparameter to kind of tune um, and then here they go into other things, I guess what's important is the experiments, and uh, and here they do it on CIFAR, and uh, and they show that yes, indeed they're doing this uh, with the max norm in this case um, was better, and then with dropout it was better on this architecture. So again, it, it seems to be like quite a reasonable method because um, they are even though sure this p even is a, a hyperparameter to to consider um they are all consistently better than without this uh than the other methods in this case um here it's a bit closer so again these are marginal improvements but improvements nonetheless and they show that hey this is pretty good like here there's quite a significant improvement with dropout um so again this lands on top and uh, and so on and so forth so so it seems to be quite a reasonable method for generalization again this uh, this seems to be the idea right uh, and yeah so obviously i couldn't go into much more detail because i want to keep these videos shorter but uh, that's the main idea where we are um maybe back into the simple mathematics which i think this uh, idea is quite nice uh, where you can uh, pretty much notice that the spectral norm of uh, of a matrix or you know any kind of matrix norm is super intimately related with the with the, um with the Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant so that's that's i guess the main takeaway from this paper 
uh, which which is quite an obvious observation, but you know it gives you more intuition into what's going on. And then um, yeah, it's quite well formulated, and uh, I enjoyed it quite a lot. So hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, see you next time.